Hi, this is Nathan Pierce from F5's programmability and orchestration team. This video is part of episode two of the iWorkflow 201 series. We're going to look at deploying an application service template today, and we're going to do that via the REST API. So just a quick recap as we start with every episode. This is the environment. We have a cluster of iWorkflows. I am communicating only with the first in the cluster, 10.128.1.130, which is talking to my big IP virtual edition. And we have internal and external networks and a management network that I am using to communicate iWorkflow to big IP to do my deployments for me. We have a couple of web servers down the bottom. Um, which is just some Node.js scripts responding with content. So let's jump in and start moving forward. So we're going to use Postman again. At the start of this article, we already posted one video, which is just some tips and tricks on how to get the most out of Postman by using environment variables. We're going to continue using these environment variables so we don't have to keep typing things in. You'll see I already have an IP address. And actually, I'm just going to renew my token because that one is not new. Again, we covered this in a previous one. I'm telling it to give me a token for user one because we're doing these actions as a tenant, not as the administrator role. So user one has now got a token which requested that has been updated into my Postman environment variable. And now consequent transactions will use the xf 5 auth token and provide the token Let's just test that I have a valid token and it works. There we go. We have just done a quick review of the tenant memberships for my roles. So management shared or the roles for the person whose token this belongs to gives me a nice list of my access control. Um, so I'm a member of my tenant one and I can access resources that are below that and HTTP methods like delete, patch, put, post get the role based access control is extremely granular and powerful with iWorkflow. But we'll talk about that in another episode. So we've got our token. We've tested that I can actually use my token by requesting a list of the tenants and the roles that I'm um, a member of and participating with. So now what we're going to do is actually just have a look around the tenant environment. So you notice almost everything is related to this URI context. So this collection, my tenant, and then below that I have resources I can access. For example, connectors. So show me the connectors that I have access to. Now, I've been given my tenant one as my tenant, and that tenant has a connector associated with it, which is a local connector, so it's not a connector off to Cisco APIC or VMware NSX or AWS. It's a connector just locally, and the local connector is big IP. We also have a VCMP connector for F5's virtual clustered multiprocessing. So that's F5's hypervisor you can run on the chassis and, and some of the appliances where you can carve up a big IP to have multiple instances that are completely isolated. And this is the name of my connector. So we're just using URIs for resources that are below the my ten one connector. Now we've had a look at that. I've actually set another one of my little scripts it's a little for loop that grabs the payload and for every connector it finds it automatically populates the UUID for that connector and the name of the connector as well so if I need to refer back to these later I've got them stored in my environment variable so again refer back to the postman pro tips video at the start of this article if you want to understand a little bit more about those those things. So we're going to keep moving forward. Let's look at the virtuals and pool members that I have. So again, this is using management IP and the auth token to perform an action of under the my tenant one collection, asking for the virtual server resources, which are a child of the tenant collection. So again, now the server level, that's virtual servers and pool members. So because we've already deployed a service before, which was listening on 10.128, 10.20 is the VIP on port 80, and then my two servers, 20.1, 80.80, 20.2, 
8080. So all of this is mimicking the environment that we've already posted to that's in our lab. Just to confirm all of this, let's log on to iWorkflow as a tenant. So again, not as an administrator that sets up the platform. We're logging in as a tenant who's responsible for deploying services using the connectors and environment that were distributed by the administrator. So we've got one here showing red. Um, that's got one that's working, one that's not working. I've got a couple running here at the same time right now. We're going to go through and look at some of these things. So this one's showing red because I, I just wanted to show the difference of the feedback. I actually deployed a service that was um, in the service template. It was I told it it was listening on 8081. If we go quickly look at my little node servers, I have nothing listening on 8081. So one of them's failing, one of them's working. Uh, this one has two active member counts, this one has zero. But anyway, the importance is we've got these services that it knows about, um, we've got these virtual servers that it knows about, 21 is the one that's broken, 20 is the one that's working fine. Something that's tricked up some people, if you go into here, it actually lists, it says 8080, but if we take a look inside of that, it's actually got port 8080. This is a list of server addresses, but it's also got port 881. So they're actually both listed under the same thing. So don't get caught out by that. Um, let's go back out. So now we've confirmed all these things do in fact exist. Let's go back to the REST API. So we've had a look at the environment. Lastly, let's have a look at the service templates that are available to my user account, user one. So I only have, um, I've done a request again, templates IAP. Scroll down a little, you'll see there's just the one that I have. Only one of them has been set up by the administrator for me, which is service type A. That's all I have permission to look at. That's the only one that's been associated with my tenant one. Um, and this is telling me virtual server pools. Um, it's telling me the address it takes. It's got a description field. If you've worked um, with apps before, or even if you've watched some of the videos in the iWorkflow 101 series, you'll notice from all these fields, if we go back to the GUI, and let's say I'm deploying a new one, and there's the same template, service type A, you'll notice this is all I have available to edit. This is exactly the same data here. It's telling me the default value, whether it's required, so is it a mandatory field? Uh, here, default value port 80. It's a port, the description is port. Validator, it's actually checking that you're not entering text instead of a number when there's data entered. So you'll see it's exactly the same thing. This is basically what's being used behind the scenes. This is the kind of information that's uh, relevant to your DevOps tool operators or integrators that are, are very familiar with REST. Um, this is the information they need to understand how to communicate with iWorkflow when making deployment, but without needing to understand everything about the big IPs running in the back end. So the last thing to list, let's take a look at the ones that have actually been deployed. So this is the layer four to seven services deployed by this tenant. You'll see here, my app service type one, web front end, it uses this template, which is the only one we have available. It's been deployed by this tenant. If we take a look, 10, 1, 2, 8, 10, 20, name, address, port, etc. So it's all familiar information. This is just the REST interface. It has some extra information, the cloud uh, connector that it was linked to. It's got some information about the time when it was deployed, etc. Um, and so on. And here's the second one that was in the list, 21. This is the one, as we saw, was failing, marked red because 8081, which doesn't exist. So we've got a couple of them up here. Scrolling back up, and this one was called My Test Deployment, one that was created earlier. So now that we've done all of those things, we're going to go on to deploying 
one of these application services templates. So you'll see I've got my token, etc. We're quite familiar with that process already. Now what we're going to look at is the payload that I'm going to send. So this is what I'm going to send to my iWorkflow to tell it that using my connector, go and deploy these settings. Now you'll see familiar terms like tables, rows, columns. Think of them as like a spreadsheet. The table, you have the rows, which is the names of the properties. It's, it's clearer when you have multiple values like down here. You've got columns, address, port, and then the rows under those is the addresses and the ports. So it's easy to pick up if you follow that. Now I've already deployed one called my test deployment, so I'm going to give this a very creative name of my test deployment too. But just before we run this, I'm going to show a neat little trick. Because you might be asking, how am I meant to learn all of this formatting and how to structure this correctly so that it works? Well, it's not easy the first few times that you look at it, but the administrator of iWorkflow can be kind to you and can help you out. We're going to log out as user one. So when the administrator sets this environment up, here's a little trick we can go to the table of contents for the interface. Now, you have to log in as admin for this. This is an administrator privilege uh, to be able to get into this environment. And then it actually redirects to a service. Same credentials. You have to log in twice to get into this. And here we have all of the collections and resources within the rest interface. So what we're going to do is save a little typing. We can filter. You can see that that is delightfully useful. Now here we have one that was already deployed. We're going to look at this web front end. This is the one that works successfully. My test deployment was the one we broke because we gave it 8081 which doesn't exist. So we'll look at the neat one. Now if I look at the one that's been deployed already, you'll see this is very familiar. Variables, we've got tables, columns, each one, rows, again, name, columns, address, port, and then the rows, address, port, address, port. Now, it's still not really showing you the formatting, but now that we've got one deployed already, we can actually take a look at how that worked. Now, you can even actually do these deployments via this little interface we've got running on the box. But if we want to talk to it programmatically, clicking the advanced button down the bottom now shows me the JSON payload that was sent to deploy that service. So my administrator could then just say, look, I've deployed one in the lab after I've tested and created this for you. All you need to know is this information. This is an example of a successful deployment. So let's say I was struggling to understand the structure of how the rows and the columns worked. Well, actually, the administrator, if they'd given me this, um, an example of one that had been deployed when they were tuning and developing the template before handing it out, they could just provide me this information, and you'll see it's exactly this. So that's pretty useful. Um, they've got a carriage return where I didn't have a carriage return. That's fine. As long as it's properly formatted JSON, then everybody's happy. So now that we've done that and we've actually got that template, that makes it really easy for us to to just send these and deploy these. And something else I'm going to have to quickly do is change the address of the VIP because I've already used that address. We're going to move it on to 23 now. We can reuse uh, pool members, which is fine. So now I'm going to hit send and we have a response already. It's move the window a bit and here's the response. You'll notice it's formatted. This is my new deployment. It's looking just like this response we got back from the previous one. So we have a deployed service. It was really that simple. So this is the response in the bottom half of the screen. The top half of the screen is what was sent. So it's not actually that tricky once you've got a, a look at that formatting we're going to log in now quickly back as a user Oops, if i type correctly i workflow we'll go in as user one because that was the user that had the auth token we were using so it's under the user one tenant 
It's also actually the only one that we have running on here. You'll notice my deployment too. That was the one we just created. It's running and happy because I gave it ports that actually work. And there we go. 10.128.120. Acme.com was the name that we had in there. So it's used the template. It's healthy. It's up and running. Good. So there we have it. Um, here's a link to the template we used actually in the template resources. Uh, all these things have linked back to the resources that they're connected to. You'll notice this is quite familiar as well, giving you the descriptions, etc. So once you're a little more familiar and you don't need the examples from one pre-deployed, you can come here and actually just look up the names of these variables um, when you call the template itself. So even as a user, I don't need to be an administrator when I look at that. If I come back to listing the L4-7 to templates, you'll see it's the same information on that other screen. So is required, false, you know, we don't have to do that, it's not mandatory, port is required, etc, etc. So there you have it, we've deployed another successful service. Um, taking a quick look at the, it's my phone ringing in the background, that was an inconvenient timing. And here we are on the big IP at the end of all of this. So the deployment was performed via user one who had no knowledge of um, big IP architecture. This is where we start to get into some excellent self-service capabilities. Here it is, my test deployment two um, with our servers and all of the profiles that the big IP experts had already determined um, needed to be set up this way and moved ahead on that one. So there we have it, another successful deployment. Uh, not requiring any interface whatsoever. Thanks for listening. It's been Nathan Pierce from FI's Programmability and Orchestration Team.